download coming to you live from our Church Milton headquarters here in Detroit, Michigan. Simon is on vacation. He's going to be back on Monday. As faithful Catholics continue to watch a significant portion of the church implode, it's worth paying attention to the reality that as the remaining few set about to rebuild what the majority will have destroyed, that we understand how this has all come about. Whatever the motivation, and that depends on the individual, the reality is that Catholic leaders made a fatal mistake back in the mid-1960s and early 1970s by setting on a course to shed Catholic identity so as to make the church more appealing to non-Catholics. And by non-Catholics, we mean with an eye largely to Protestants. The liturgy was altered in such a way as to accommodate this desire. Teaching was expressed in more bland terms so as to present an emphasis on what Catholics and Protestants share in common as opposed to what separates us. Ecumenism became all the rage in Catholic circles. After 50 years, it's safe to say that this grand experiment has failed utterly. Few Protestants come into the church while hordes of Catholics flow out of it. A crisis has in fact been brought about by this approach. Protestantism is a heresy, and like all other heresies, it has some aspects of truth to it, but the differences are what are important. Protestantism came about 1,500 years after the church was established and has now spawned 40,000 different denominations, each with its own twist on Christ, salvation, morality, the sacraments, and so forth. So today we're going to revisit one of our episodes of our flagship show here as we do every Friday at the Apostolate, The One True Faith, examining the differences, this one, examining the differences between Catholics and Protestants. Christine, as a former Protestant, will look at the radically different approaches to our Lord between Catholics and Protestants. And Brad is going to look at the problem of Catholics who have become Protestant in their thinking. And then I'll bring out a point from Pope St. Pius V that really brings home the real issues underlying all of this. Christine, let's start with the, shall we say, the uh, vision or the image of Christ. Uh, it's very different. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people running around today believing <coughs> they worship and love Jesus Christ, when in fact, many of them have really made Jesus into their own image and they're worshiping false Christs. Uh, and we have a clip here of Michael discussing false Christ versus authentic Christ. If people love their personal version of Jesus Christ, what they have constructed in their own minds, they worship a false Christ. They worship a false Christ. Jesus came and said, this is who I am, this is what you must believe, this, 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 this. Not that because that's more comfortable. Not the other because, well, you had a rough childhood and this is the best I can do. You love Jesus Christ for who Jesus Christ is and who he says he is, not who someone else, or more importantly, I say who he is. We love Christ for himself, for his own sake. And to be certain, today there are hundreds, hundreds of various versions of Jesus Christ out there in the marketplace. There are Jesuses flying around all over the place. Which one's the right one? Are any of them the right one? And that's the fundamental question. In the 19th century, uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman was an Anglican churchman, and he caused uh, you know, huge scandal in the Anglican church when he converted to Catholicism. Now, when he was an Anglican, he thought that that was sort of the perfect, um, he called it the via media, the middle way. It was the perfect um, place between Catholicism and you know, low church Protestantism. But when he converted to Catholicism, he realized, you know what? There's only two options here. You're either Catholic, there's only Catholicism, or there's atheism and there's no in-between. Now, what does that mean? What he meant essentially was once you reject the magisterium as an authority, an objective authority, you are sliding on the path which ultimately ends in atheism, secularism. Now, you may be at different points along that spectrum. You may be here where you're an Anglican, or maybe further down the road where you're a Puritan, or down here where you're non-denominational, or down here where you're just kind of spiritual, or down here where you're agnostic, but you're somewhere along the road, the which road leads to, it, yeah. to atheism because you have rejected this objective magisterial authority and you've essentially made yourself the Pope. And that's really what it comes down to over and above, you know, questions about Mary or communion of saints or sacraments or purgatory, anything like that. 
speaking as the former Protestant here, the one question that you have to clarify before anything else is authority. What is your authority? And Protestants will say, well, my authority is scripture. Well, no, because someone has to interpret that scripture. Well, they'll say it's the Holy Spirit. And somebody had to compile that scripture. Yes, yeah. But, but they'll come back and say, well, it's the Holy Spirit that interprets scripture. Okay, who interprets what the Holy Spirit tells you authoritatively? Because you've got <laughs> thousands of denominations saying that they are following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But they come out with different ideas about abortion, contraception, divorce and remarriage, cohabitation, masturbation. And these are not minor things. These are things that if you get it wrong, you go to hell. So someone has to authoritatively interpret scripture that objectively for all time is the truth. And that's the Catholic Church. And you, that's the question, the authority is the question that has to be first resolved you know, to, to find the truth, which is the Catholic Church. Yeah, it's an interesting point also, this kind of, uh, you know, you're Catholic or you're on the slippery slope to atheism. Where, again, you might be at a different point, but the, 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 the movement is in that way that uh, you see now, uh, which is really interesting, and Brad will get to this in your part, the, this movement among uh, uh, evangelicals and uh, the large sort of Protestant megachurch thing, the phenomenon that was you know, really popular 10, 15 years ago, even that is beginning to wane. They're starting to move around and move from this one to that one and then drop out. If you go and read all the journals and periodicals of the evangelical thing, which is really the dominant Protestant force now in the United States, the main lines have kind of given up the ghosts, there's not much left of them, uh, you see that they are losing the faith, their faith. They're starting, you know, the huge number of them support same-sex marriage. I mean, it's just got all this stuff. So it's really funny, sad, funny in a, the rhetorical sense, that the church leaders here in the United States have figured, well, we need to hitch our wagon to that. We have to do what they do. We have to have our big mega things and our laser shows and our rock concerts. Event and Catholicism. Event Catholicism. And it's like, well, you no, know, no, are you watching what's happening to them? You're Catholic or you lose faith. What, wherever you are on that spectrum, you might die before you become, you know, full-blown atheist. But you give up the authority and you become your own, and then your own makes up excuses for whatever it is you want to do. Right. Well, we have this uh, Protestantized Catholic um, body now in America and around the world, basically, and this is fundamentally hinged on this phrase "personal conscience." And here to talk about personal conscience is Michael on the One True Faith. Protestants who substitute the hard truth of the Catholic Church in mind and body and substitute that for the good feeling and emotional high of a given moment are worshiping a false Christ. Catholics who disregard the teachings of this church established by the second person of the Blessed Trinity and set their personal conscience in contradiction to the law of God are gambling with hellfire. There is no division in the body of Christ in heaven, and there can be no division in the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ here on earth. And it cuts both ways. For those who have visibly separated themselves from the church, either Catholic church, either by walking out of it or stubbornly refusing to come into it because it is the church founded by Jesus Christ, it also goes for Catholics who sit in the pews on Sunday and have invisibly separated themselves from the church. They still attend Mass, but they disbelieve, and they are not living the life that the church requests of them, that Jesus Christ demands of them. So what the Protestants, what Christine was talking about, the Protestants is private interpretation of Scripture. We've all become our own popes, basically. Martin Luther, they say, tried to do away with the pope, but he basically made everybody their own pope. What we have today is a Protestantized Catholic body where everyone's personal conscience basically picks and chooses their cafeteria-style Catholics. What we started off with private interpretation of Scripture has become private interpretation of magisterial teaching. Yeah. Starting with 1968, Paul VI, Humaya Vitae became full-blown uh, avant-garde to say... The birth control and cyclical. Birth, birth control and cyclical. No, you can't have artificial contraception in, within marriage. We went from personal conscience of safe sex 
marriage, because it was supposed to be used between a husband and a wife within the context of marriage at the time, uh, Catholics were saying, to same-sex marriage, which is the complete opposite end of the spectrum, and many of those Catholics would be horrified about same-sex marriage, you know, 50 years later. But they began that ball rolling when you said, I can do it my way. Mm -hmm. So that was the problem. Now we have uh, contraception, abortion, no-fault separation. Uh, civil remarriage, cohabitation, same-sex marriage, and transgenderism, which is basically private interpretation of nature. Yeah. And the Catholics, uh, you were on uh, Louder with Crowder recently, and Stephen Crowder was raised, or was taught by Catholics, and he said most of these bad Catholics, Catholics. Bad Catholics <laughs> in Quebec for 18 years in school, and he said most of the Catholic body out there is polling left of of even where secular society would be on many of these issues. Yeah. And why is that? Because as you're talking about the Catholic identity has been lost, one of the reasons for that is we replaced sociology and psychology for faith and morals. We haven't made any distinctions from the pulpit or in catechism on these issues and allowed everybody to dissent without standing up against it. Yeah, I mean, it's to the point also, you said in, the, in your headlines report that in Quebec, formerly Catholic Quebec, I mean, stronghold of the faith, bastion of the faith, now they're handing out the abortion pills like candy for right. free. In a Catholic society, well, former Catholic former society. Former Catholic. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the symptom of it. It's it, it, it's really disappointing. I mean, you know, and I people want to understand because every time we touch this topic of Protestants, immediately somebody comes out with, "Well, I know Aunt Betty, and she's a Protestant, but she's really good." And we're not talking about Aunt Betty. <laughs> we're talking about two systems. And can there be? Are there? Sure. Are there people who uh, who are identify as Protestant who are very you know loving and concerned and, tr and try to follow everything that they understand about Jesus as well as they can given the information that they have? Yes. That nobody's making the point of that. We're not talking about you know you can't make law based on an individual person. So, uh, but we're talking about the system. The system that it, it spawns a, a sense of. Uh, you know, I'm just going to make up my own decisions. So, and that's gained a lot of turbocharging in the in the fourth con context of the last two synods. Oh, yeah. It almost seems like it's it's an okay thing to push now, and it's really crazy. We're just Protestantizing all the Catholics. Yeah, it's really. I, I mean, look, everybody who understands what authentic ecumenism is is for authentic ecumenism, but what it is is come back to the church. If it was even that, it's not you come in -ism. It's we all get along and be smiley and maybe you'll wander back in or not. Or there's no distinctions between. There's almost a blurring of distinctions we saw between the Lutheran Accord and the Catholic Church. There isn't an emphasis on you come in -ism, on conversion or even reversion of Catholics who have left. That's a huge problem. We're not trying to make Catholics of anybody. Well, Father Thomas Rusica said the purpose of ecumenism is to make Muslims better Muslims, exactly. and Jews better Jews, and Hindus better Hindus, and whatever. It's not really to bring people to the church. That's yeah. crazy. Because no. they, they don't they don't believe that. Look, I mean, yeah. if you want authentic ecumenism, you know, it, it it's and the funny thing is, this is largely a Catholic thing. There aren't there isn't this great rush on the part of uh, Protestant denominations. You may have an individual here or there, but there isn't this great rush. There never has been to so. We have to figure out how to reunite with Catholic. That's just not their theology. The idea was bring down all the fences and maybe some sheep will wander in, but basically 52% of all Catholics in America wandered out of the fold. Yeah, and, and that's just the ones who formerly left. When we have, uh, look, if you, want, if you want authentic ecumenism, then you have to live a life of holiness. That's it, you have to be a saint. And uh, from our uh, One True Faith show, Simon would normally throw to this, but I'm going to throw to me. Because <laughs> we, we always give you three sound bites from, uh, from the show. So you'll become a premium member and whet your appetite here. So let's go to the last sound bite. Ah. Good job. <laughs> Here's the message to Catholics. You want unity? You be holy. You be holy. Here's the message to Catholics, to the church, from the lips of our blessed Lord himself. To whom much has been given, much will be demanded. If you're Catholic and you're hearing that and you can't smell the brimstone burning, something's wrong. To whom much has been given, much will be demanded. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is the salt if it loses its flavor? Words of our blessed Lord. What does he say? It is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Catholics, sit up and pay attention.
sit up and pay attention. You want to know why there's no vocations in the church? Because we are sowing what we have reaped, or reaping what we have sowed. That's why. What you sow, so shall you reap. We're sinning with the best of them. We are. Because we are held to a higher standard because of the means of salvation that have been given to us through the sacraments of Jesus Christ. We are sinning with the best of them. And I know exactly what I'm talking about because I was one of them. You know, as you look at all of this, uh, these events happening in the church and the world, uh, it, Pope Pius, the, Pope St. Pius V said, all the evil in the world is due to lukewarm Catholics. And, you know, that's it. If the church, you want to know the condition of the church, just look at the condition of the world. It's just that simple. One you know, case in point, Malta. Yeah. Malta was this traditionally wonderful Catholic country, Catholic stronghold. But it has gone downhill over the past few years. 2011, legalized divorce, um, you know, legalized the birth control pill, um, and the, pornography, and now it's about to legalize same-sex marriage. Um, it was the first country to this ban gay conversion therapy. Five years. Yeah. This is in yeah, five but years. All you have to do is look at the bishops. Yeah. The Malta Jesus. bishops just released guidelines on Morris Letizia saying, you know what, divorce, remarried, active gays, whatever, come up, receive Holy Communion. Um, and the, they were kind of waffled on the whole gay civil unions thing. I mean, look at the bishops. I mean, they're trying to put up a fight now against gay marriage, but I'm sorry, it's too late. Oh, you, you paved the way for all this. It was you. <laughs> that ship has sailed. Yeah. 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 I think Newsways Ministry came out with it after the Malta guidelines came out and said, why doesn't this apply to gays too? I mean, we all have our own conscience on this. Yeah. Well, that's true. You know, you got to say, look, you know, we're, we're no fan of Father Martin, Father James Martin, and all the, the, the evil that he pushes. But when Bishop Paprocki came out with his uh, Springfield, Illinois, a couple weeks ago and released his letters saying, you know, no, uh, you know, no sacraments, no funerals, et cetera, unless there's public repentance uh, for, you know, same sex couples and all of that, Father Martin did in kind of a roundabout way make an excellent point that well if you're going to single out the gays I think he has a very special interest in that arena um, if you're going to single out the gays well, what about all the divorced remarried Catholics that are there and what about the ones who are contracepting and what about this you know what he's right that was exactly what Amoris Letizia should have ironed out yeah and should have stood up for and didn't so yeah take that one up with the Pope yeah, it is. It is very. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, it, it's it's very clear that this is. They have just continually let down, let down, and now they're building a firewall on the wrong side of the fire. The fire's right. already burning. It got yeah. past your firewall, mm -hmm. and y you guys did it. I, I mean, so, you know, the reason we want to emphasize in this show is that you know, look, this is all going to come to an end, uh, and I don't mean the end of the world. This is all going to come to an end. The church is going to become extinct in the United States and there will be just little pockets of people left. From there, a great rebuilding is going to have to happen and you have to be aware of what caused this demolition of the faith. And what it was, was a lack of adherence to it in its authentic uh, beauty and purity. Yeah. And that's it. So as you're rebuilding, you cannot let even the slightest little thing in that is not pure, that, that, that's impure in thought or deed or anything. It's amazing too, if you pull back 30,000 foot view or 2,000 year view, what happened in the last 50 years was an amazingly fast paced change. We went from Gregorian chant, I mean Leo the 13th, Pius the 10th, we had uh, Thomism coming back, we had Latin coming, we had Gregorian chant was being restored, our liturgy was all getting polished up through Pius the 12th, and it was just solid that the missionary, you know, you want to go out to the peripheries, the missionaries were doing that all yeah, over they the world. Yeah, they were going out to the peripheries. Explosion of Catholic teaching and everything all over the world. That we're seeing now in Africa. And it was just this ledge, and exactly what happened was the prelates did not stand up for Catholic identity. Right. Uh, in their liturgy, and in their preaching, and in their teaching, and you blur all the distinctions, and then everybody can just, and then when the dissent happens, you're actually honoring it, you're allowing it. I mean, you, uh, Morris, the teach, or um, Malta guidelines you just brought up. The bishop there said, if a priest stands up against this, you're going to be whacked. You know, get, it, get on board or get out. So a priest can't stand up against this, and that's exactly what happened with uh, well, can. Canadian guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> He'll get to do it one time. The Canadian collapse, you know. They all said if you, a priest wasn't allowed to stand up against this dissent. 
from the prelates on down. So what do you expect? Yeah, no, you I mean, know, you tear down the fences. And you people are trying to keep the, the the sheep in the fold, and even the shepherds are being pulled away. Yeah, no, actually leading the sheep away. Yeah. The serious issue that Catholics face today is that so many, too many of our leaders, as Brad just said, seem to not believe the reality of what, or rather, who the Catholic Church is. Attempts to make the church more approachable by making her seem less triumphant or superior have simply destroyed the identity of most Catholics. Most Protestants never really held the church in high regard anyway. By watering her down, it's had the effect of also, for most Catholics, not holding her in high regard. Those few Catholics that are left standing as all of this proceeds to its horrible end need to bear all this in mind as we set about to rebuild. The Catholic Church is Jesus Christ present here on earth. Everything else, no matter how well intended, is a facsimile and full of error. There is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. For my fellow panelists, Michael Vorst saying thank you for joining us today. Be sure and come back Monday for the most well-informed panel discussion in the whole Catholic media world. May you and your loved ones have a blessed weekend. God love you. Thank you.